Well, I appreciate uh, you all inviting me to come to speak to this group. Uh, you know, uh, I have really uh, um, a great admiration for the North Carolina Native Plant Society uh, and just feel honored to, you know, have been invited to give this talk. Um, Kathy gave uh, a very lengthy and uh, uh, introduction to to me, and um, I I think if you're listening at home, you probably noticed that the word viburnum didn't appear once. <laughs> um, so this is you know not um, not my field of expertise, but um, I have jumped in with both feet uh, and really found uh, you know the preparation for this talk to be uh, you know really uh, illuminating. I do you know want to uh, I guess. Start out um, with, uh, you know, what I hope is a punny question, uh, viburnums, why not? Um, and, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting plant group. Um, and, you know, maybe we could start by digging into, you know, some of the common name associations. Um, let's see, hopefully this comes through. Uh, you know, arrowwood is a common name that's associated with, uh, you know, with this genus. And that's because indigenous peoples in really multiple parts of the of the world used, uh, you know, uh, small diameter uh, twigs and stems from this plant um, as uh, arrow shafts. So here we have uh, sort of the mummified remains of Utsi, the iceman. Uh, this is a, a, a mummy that was found uh, in the Alps between Austria and Italy uh, about 3,400 years ago. Um, and, you know, uh, with his remains were also some personal effects, including a quiver with uh, about a dozen arrows, um, several of which, uh, you know, were uh, air, uh, shafts, arrow shafts made from uh, viburnum and from dogwood. So it's um, this, this particular instance is from the Alps, but it's also known that here in North America, uh, Native Americans also used viburnum wood for arrow shafts. Um, so kind of an interesting uh, you know, acknowledgement there to the common name. Here's an overview of sort of the territory that I'm expecting that we're gonna cover tonight. Um, again, I'm focused on the species that uh, you know, are native to North Carolina. I'm gonna talk a little bit about taxonomy, uh, geographic distribution, uh, key characteristics, landscape use and wildlife benefit. And they're all gonna be sort of interspersed. Um, so we'll keep on moving. So historically, viburnums, you know, were placed in the honeysuckle family, the Caprifoli ACAE. Uh, and then there has been some moving and shaking and shuffling within uh, sort of the plant taxonomy here. They were moved into the uh, Muscatel family. Um, and then uh, that has more recently been uh, sort of renamed uh, Viburn ACAE. Uh, it contains uh, five genera, uh, adoxa, cynodoxa, tetradoxa, and then what will be most familiar to us in Eastern uh, North America are Sambucus and Viburnum. Uh, viburnum has then been broken down into about 12 sections um, of closely related species. Uh, and we're gonna touch on at least four of them this evening that are apparent in the flora of, uh, of North Carolina. Um, you, viburnums, you know, sort of writ large, have extremely variable uh, morphology. Uh, you know, here's a quick table that I have borrowed just straight out of uh, Michael Durr's book, Viburnum, Viburnums, Flowering Shrubs for Every Season. Uh, you know, in every category here, from their habit to their leaves, uh, you know, to their buds, uh, and, you know, moving on to sort of the inflorescence type, uh, the flowers, characteristics of the flowers and the fruits, highly uh, variable. Um, and uh, while I'm talking about Michael Durr, who has really literally written the book on viburnums, uh, you know, I was tickled to um, see a, a quote from him that said, a garden without a viburnum uh, is like uh, life without music or art. They're just so uh, versatile. Uh, and, and, and such wonderful additions to the garden uh, that, you know, they shouldn't be overlooked by, by horticulturists. So there's a lot of variable morphology, um, but there are a few things that tend to hold true over uh, time and space. Um, you know, maybe I'll start with the biggest is that viburnums, you know, are woody plants with oppositely arranged leaves. 
almost all the time. And there's an asterisk there because even in, you know, the world of viburnums, uh, you know, uh, absolutes um, are abhorred. Um, so there are some species where you'll have three leaves, you know, in a sort of a world arrangement at the node. Um, but, you know, as a general rule of thumb, this is an opposite uh, arrangement um, of leaves and twigs. Uh, and in North America, uh, in Eastern North America anyway, uh, when you get into trees and native trees and shrubs, there are just not that many uh, genera that have that opposite arrangement. So, uh, you know, we're starting to sort of like narrow the, uh, the identification uh, process uh, right there. Secondly, uh, viburnums have a single seeded uh, um, fruit called a droop. Usually it's sort of uh, elliptical uh, or, or ovoid. Uh, it's got a fleshy outer covering. Uh, with a hard bony uh, interior and a single seed. And then again, flowers. I mentioned just a minute ago that viburnums writ large all over the world. Uh, you can see a lot of different variations on flowers, but here in our flora, they tend to conform to a, a more narrow spectrum. So they're cymes. Uh, this is kind of a, 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 a round dome-shaped inflorescence made up of uh, many tiny little flowers. So in viburnums, uh, these are small, perfect, meaning they have male and female parts, uh, white five-lobed flowers, um, companionate, uh, you know, in their, in their shape, uh, again, with five yellow stamens, and usually, and, three, and a three-lobed stigma, and that corresponds to sort of a, a um, three-ovary um, uh, fruit. Um, occasionally, some viburnums uh, will have an outer ring of much more showy, sterile, what we call ray flowers, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when we bear down on a, uh, one of our species that has that particular characteristic. So these, you know, sort of uh, generally, generally um, hold true for um, the, the native viburnums in North Carolina. Um, I'm, I'm kind of approaching this material uh, based on the uh, taxonomic key uh, that my colleague Alan Weekly um, has developed. Uh, and I'll acknowledge right up front that this is an abridged version and a heavily adapted version for this presentation. Um, but I do find it, you know, sort of a helpful starting point. Uh, there are a couple of texts, a couple of slides in this presentation that are uh, text heavy excerpts uh, from, from Alan Weekly's key. Uh, so this is you know, where I like to start most of uh, my own uh, sort of uh, understanding of uh, plant, uh, plant groups taxonomy and field identification is literally the low hanging fruit, some pun intended. Uh, you know, when we look at the native viburnums, uh, you know, they tend to fall out in, they do fall out in two groups. Um, those that have a, a palmate lobing and palmate venation, and those that uh, the leaves are unlobed and the venation is pinnate. Uh, so just, you know, because I'm not sure the full breadth of the folks that are in the room here, I wanna, you know, briefly sort of review that terminology. Uh, you know, palm lobing is, you know, a leaf that is um, sort of broken up into uh, multiple parts. So you can think about um, uh, maple leaves or sweet gum leaves um, you know, as kind of classic examples of lobed leaves versus something that is more entire, uh, like an, an oak or a beech um, that isn't divided into uh, sort of subunits. And veination, you know, is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the network of veins usually seen on the underside. And so palmate veination, all those veins are radiating from a central point. And in pinnate venation, uh, there's kind of a primary axis uh, for the primary vein and then secondary veins branch off of it in uh, what I would call sort of a longitudinal. So again, palmate you know, lobing and palmate venation versus pinnate. Uh, when we look at that combination of a palmate uh, lobing and palmate venation, there's really only one species that fits that bill in our flora, and that's uh, maple leaf viburnum, viburnum acerifolium. Um, so you can, you know, if you lean in there, you can see that these leaves bear an uncanny resemblance to maple leaves, hence the common name. You know, this is uh, widespread from uh, New Brunswick uh, and Ontario, west to Wisconsin and south to the panhandle of Florida and Texas. Uh, it's kind of a low growing, uh, 
sparsely branched shrub, four to six feet tall. It often suckers, uh, developing loose colonies like the one depicted here. Um, I'll take a minute to say these um, geographic distribution maps that I'm sharing, and you'll see one on the left-hand side of your screen. These are also taken from Alan Weekly's Flora of the Southeast. Uh, and uh, let's see, the, uh, the, the squares, if it's a solid square, that means uh, it is common. If it is a square that has a dot in it, it means it is uncommon. And if it's a hollow square, it means that it's rare. So, you know, we, we can sort of see a pattern here. Again, I'm going to use Viverta macerifolium as an example that, you know, it is more prevalent north and west of us and less prevalent, you know, in the coastal plain. Um, there's a little diagram at the bottom of each of these maps with some arrows. Uh, and those arrows reflect sort of the radiant distribution of a plant from what we call home base here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, our point of reference for Allen's herbarium. So the geographic range of Viburnum acerifolium extends west, northwest, and north of where we are. And you'll see that sort of illustrated in those arrows. Um, with some of these maps, the arrows vary in length, meaning that you know it, the, the distribution may extend further in one direction than in other directions. So I'll continue going when I belabor that point any any longer. Um, you know, Viburnum acerifolium, uh, you know, is one of the most shade tolerant, um, in, you know, uh, species in the genus, um, and it's a, adapted to um, relatively dry soils in a sort of a woodland setting. Um, so it really makes for a nice naturalized plant in the landscape. Um, it also is a very, you know, important uh, wildlife, um, uh, what do I say, um, species of sustenance. Uh, so these are some, uh, some of several mammals that um, browse on the twigs and the bark, um, you know, including the Eastern cottontail rabbit, white-tailed deer, and the North American uh, beaver. As a rule, I'd say, uh, you know, the, the entire genus is, is a very important part of our understory for wildlife. So uh, sort of, you know, zooming in a little bit more on the morphological characteristics of Viburnum acerifolium. Again, opposite leaves, uh, they are simple, uh, three-lobed leaves, two to four inches long, about as wide. They have uh, typically a sort of a, a rounded to chordate, uh, you know, which is chordate means it has a notch at the base of the leaf. Uh, and those, uh, the, the, uh, the lobes come to sort of a, a sharp point, acute to acuminate point. Um, they're fuzzy and they hang on a petiole, a little stalk that supports the leaf about a half an inch to an inch long. So you can see on the picture on the right there, sort of uh, a close up of that pubescent uh, texture, that fuzzy texture on the underside of the leaves. It's also a very important uh, uh, source for, of food. It's a larval host for the spring azure butterfly and a nectar host for the gold banded skipper. Um, you know, and the fruits, uh, which we'll see momentarily, you know, are, uh, you know, consumed by a variety of, uh, you know, small mammals and songbirds. Um, the flowers, and this was a nice way to sort of illustrate uh, sort of a classic sign for our native viburnums. Uh, you know, these flower in late April to early June. Uh, it's a yellowish white flower. So you can see the yellow stamen there that gives it that hue. Born in these sort of round domed clusters, one to three inches in diameter, uh, with a cyme, uh, you know, composed of many individual small flowers. Uh, the one that is in the center of that dome is the oldest flower, the first to open. And so they have kind of a pattern to the way the flowers, uh, you know, open and uh, and ripen ultimately into fruit. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a picture of fall color, fall foliage for uh, Viburnum acerifolium, and uh, you know, an illustration of this uh, this fruit. This is such a valuable um, food source for wildlife. Uh, it's a you know black. It matures to be a black droop somewhere in the neighborhood of a third of an inch long ripens in September and often hangs on the plant, you know, into well into winter. As I mentioned, it's got a pretty spectacular fall color. 
um, you know, ranging from uh, sort of russet reds to, to bright reds uh, and can make a really wonderful addition to the landscape. So I'm going to move on from the low hanging fruit of the palmately lobed and veined Viburnum acerifolia, uh, you know, to talk about the larger group of um, Viburnums native to North Carolina. These are, they have uh, unlobed leaves and the veination is pinnate. Uh, and again, you know, just some some things, some things to sort of keep in mind, food for thought uh, when you're walking out in the woods and uh, trying to parse out these different species in different parts of the state. Uh, so we start to look at the veination uh, more closely uh, and we see that uh, it kind of breaks out into two groups. Um, those that have uh, uh, curving veins that curve and branch repeatedly, um, you know, over their run versus those that are in very neat orderly parallel rows and as depicted there on the right, uh, you know, where uh, it's, it, you know, very straight and parallel um, veins that go all the way out to the uh, margin of the leaf uh, and end, you know, in a, one of the serrated teeth. Um, so this first group with the curving and branching veins, uh, that's in the section Lent Lentago. And it's one of the biggest sections um, of viburnum in our flora. Uh, and, you know, we further break those down by whether the uh, leaf margin is uh, entire or crenate. Is it smooth or does it have teeth? And, you know, if it has teeth, um, how closely packed are they? So I'm going to first look at, uh, you know, the, what we call the uh, the viburnum nudum complex. And that has three different species. <coughs> And maybe before I delve into the Lentago complex, uh, you know, I want to show you sort of the whole the whole range here. Um, so all of these species, uh, we have eight species uh, sort of depicted here in the section Lentago. So in North Carolina, we have about twelve native species of viburnums, and um, three quarters of them, you know, are here in uh, in Lentago. Um, but some interesting, uh, you know, sort of uh, biogeography here that, um, you know, these groups, again, sort of what's in the um, upper section here is the viburnum nudum complex. And then this is what we would call sort of the, uh, the, Lenta the core Lentago complex. <clears throat> they share uh, common ancestors. Uh, and if we were to trace these back, these are these blank cells are now extinct species. But if we trace them back, we would see that, you know, a species like Viburnum prunifolium's great great grandmother was also the great grandmother of Viburnum cassinoides. You know, so they share some ancestry as they have, you know, continued to speciate and evolve, uh, you know, across their, across their um, range. So again, back to the Viburnum nudum complex, uh, there are three species here. Um, again, these are ones that are um, either an entire leaf margin or they have a subtle uh, crenation um, with, you know, a low number of um, teeth um, along the, the low density of teeth along the leaf edge. So the three here are the Viburnum cassinoides, uh, which is commonly referred to as the uh, northern wild raisin, Viburnum nudum, the Southern wild raisin, so you could conjure up the Mason-Dixon line or the Hatfields and the McCoys. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a more recently described um, uh, closely akin species, Viburnum uh, nitidum, uh, which is more of an endemic to the coastal plain. So again, these three species uh, have more in common than, uh, than they have differences. Um, you know, there uh, some, they break out into uh, groups really by what the leaf margin uh, looks like. Um, Viburnum cassinoides is more of a higher elevation and um, northern species as seen here in the map on the left. Viburnum nudum has the broadest range. And then again, Viburnum nitidum is more of a coastal plain uh, endemic. So Viburnum cassinoides, I'm gonna take them sort of left to right, uh, usually has, you know, uh, undulate to crenulate leaves uh, with usually, uh, you know, a very subtle toothing um, to the edge of the leaf. Uh, 
And, you know, whereas the viburnum nudums and the viburnum nitidums, uh, that's more of an entire leaf margin. Uh, again, if you sort of bear down on this and, you know, refer to the, uh, the keys in the PDF, um, another distinguishing characteristic between these two groups are the peduncles. That's the, that's the little stalk that will support the flower. And then as it ripens the fruit. So in general, uh, Cassinoides, the northern wild raisin, has shorter peduncles than the uh, southern wild raisins. And there, you know, are some differences in, uh, you know, the sort of the, the ripening uh, of these fruits. So you can see the, you know, again, I'm, I'm looking here at the more southern uh, uh, species within this complex, Viburnum nudum and Viburnum nitidum. And you can see some pretty stark contrast. These photographs were taken uh, in two different years, mind you, but two days apart. Uh, you know, so we're looking at on the left, August 20th, and on the right, August 18th. And you can see that the nitidum has, uh, you know, a, a much rosier complexion. Uh, and, uh, and nudum on the left, the fruits are still um, pretty yellowish green. Uh, and that's another um, pretty defining uh, distinction between these two. I'm gonna focus in, or maybe go into a greater depth on viburnum nudum, because that's the one that has the broadest geographic distribution in North Carolina and throughout the Southeast. So, uh, it, you know, it might serve us as the type uh, for this complex. The viburnum nudum, uh, you know, usually ranges somewhere between six and eight feet tall. Uh, can be up to 15 in the wild. Uh, you know, generally not quite as wide as it is tall. It's very well suited to moist to wet areas, uh, making it sort of the go-to in a damp uh, landscape situation. Uh, they are a little bit more sensitive to high pH than other members of the genus. Um, they have a, a really high gloss leaf. You can see that nicely in the picture in the bottom right. Uh, you know, with that glossy upper surface, uh, actually both those photographs on the right. And those leaves, you know, are elliptical. Again, the margin is gonna be uh, entire, smooth without any teeth, usually three to six inches long, uh, one to two and a half inches wide and on a petiole, a stalk that's about half an inch long. Uh, really beautiful sort of creamy white flowers, uh, you know, shown here. Uh, again, it's a classic um, North Carolina viburnum. It's a white, uh, you know, white uh, corolla uh, that has uh, sort of yellowish stamens, uh, you know, sticking out above the surface. Uh, the, you know, these flowers are born on two to four inch uh, cymes, and you usually see them in April to May. And these ripen into uh, long fruits that can range in color from pink to blue and black, and those fruits typically ripen in August to October. Again, this is, uh, I would say, our, the hands down uh, selection if you want, if you're you know, looking to cite a viburnum in a uh, low line, moist part of your yard. There are a number of cultivars that have been developed um, of viburnum nudum, uh, and I've just sort of handpicked a few here. Uh, that show off some of the characteristics that are being selected. So winter tur uh, is one of the most common ones out in the trade, uh, really selected for its um, consistent fall foliage color, these deep maroons, as well as, you know, a, a sort of a variety of ripened fruit colors on the same plant. And that's a really special characteristic about viburnum nudum as a landscape plant is that you can have a, you know, a single specimen uh, you know, that has fruits that are, you know, bright pink and bright blue or purple at the same time. Uh, and there just aren't that many things that do that in our landscapes. So another one, brandy wine uh, and uh, pink beauty, uh, which I think has been touted as one of the heaviest fruiting um, cultivars in circulation. I'm going to take this juncture to sort of talk for a minute about uh, sort of a landscape consideration for viburnums. Uh, a lot of folks um, have questions about why their uh, viburnums aren't fruiting more heavily. Uh, and it's really uh, it comes down to self incompatibility. The, the entire genus is mostly self incompatible, which means that uh, a plant can't fertilize itself. You need to have two different genetically distinct individuals in order for 
successful pollination to occur. Uh, so this has some ramifications uh, from a design standpoint <clears throat> and a sourcing standpoint. Uh, I think maybe the most important one is that if we're talking about uh, cultivars, whether that's um, Winterthur or um, brandy wine uh, or uh, Pink Beauty, they're essentially clones. You know, there was a single individual that was either identified in the field or a product of you know intentional hybridization that was chosen for its attributes, and uh, they've essentially vegetatively propagated it. Uh, you know, henceforth. So all of the winter turs out there in the trade are exactly the same genetically and they can't pollinate themselves and they can't pollinate one another. So you really need to have uh, you know, a mix of genotypes in your landscape if you wanna have uh, successful fruit production. So if you're gardening with straight species, uh, you wanna ideally get plants that are grown from seed rather than from cuttings because then you're ensured that they're genetically distinct from one another. Um, if you are gardening with cultivars, uh, you want to have a, either a straight species or another cultivar uh, in the garden, you know, so that they can pollinate, cross-pollinate one another. Um, and, you know, with some species in particular, you really have to uh, be mindful about the timing of the, uh, what, what the, sort of the, the timing of bloom between um, straight species and cultivars to make sure that they're not completely mismatched and miss that window for pollinating one another. All right, back to some of our taxonomy. Uh, we talked about the nudum, the viburnum nudum complex, um, three different species within the Lentago section, uh, you know, and I described them as uh, entire or uh, with, a, with an entire or crenate margin uh, and the, you know, the teeth, uh, you know, uh, I say not so dense along the margin. Um, <clears throat> and the next group are those that, you know, have sort of a ser serrate or serulate edge um, and, you know, more, uh, more teeth along the margin of the leaf. And so we've got three different species here, uh, Lentago, Prunifolium, and Refigulum. And I'm not going to read the entire content of that slide. But, uh, you know, here's sort of an interesting infographic about the overlapping distribution of these three species. Um, so Lentago is the more northern of the species. Refigulum is the southern version, um, you know, within this complex. And uh, Prunifolium, you know, it sort of occupies this middle ground. And they are overlapping. You can find, you know, Lentago up in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, this is a seminal work from Elizabeth Spriggs, uh, you know, who contributed a, a re recent article to Arnoldia, and it's one that Alan Weekly uh, refers to in, in his flora. Um, some very interesting work that she's done out in the field, uh, sort of parsing out uh, this complex as well as the Nudum complex that we just, uh, that we just covered. I'm gonna start north and work my way south. Uh, Viburnum lentago uh, sort of occurs in uh, uh, stream bottoms and other wetlands and margins, again, from New Brunswick uh, and uh, Saskatchewan, south to West Virginia, the very corner of North, southwestern corner of North Carolina. Um, often you'll see this <clears throat> as a multi-stemmed suckering shrub, beautiful beautiful laden with flowers here. Uh, and you can see that, you know, in this distribution map, you know, it occurs in North Carolina, but its range is mostly north and, and northwest of us. Uh, it's, you know, variable from a multi-stem suckering shrub to a single trunk tree that can, as shown here, be 15 to 18 feet tall. It has these dark green, often shiny leaves, uh, you know, two to four inches long, uh, one to two inches wide with, this, you know, strongly acuminate tip. And that's really, you know, easily seen in this picture on the left where it comes to a very sharp point. Um, and you can see the serration here, you know, it's much more prominent than the viburnum nudum complex that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. A classic. North Carolina viburnum with small white flowers, with yellowish stamens, born in a cyme. There's a, you know, a trend here. 
Um, and, you know, these fruits, um, you know, mature, you know, the, the fruits mature in um, uh, sort of a pink to rose and finally a bluish black as depicted uh, there on the right. So uh, Viburnum lentago uh, flowers in May and then the fruits ripen in July and August. Interesting bark texture on these, you know, on these individuals that form sort of a singular, uh, you know, woody trunk, uh, tree trunk. It has, you know, a little bit of an exfoliating um, characteristic to it. And you can see here on the right, spectacular fall color on these. Um, they're great naturalizing plants. They're tolerant of shade, uh, as well as a wide range of soils. Uh, you know, they prefer, uh, you know, um, uh, they prefer moist conditions. Uh, one of the cultivars that's more um, prevalent out there in the trade is called deep green, uh, known for its thick glossy leaves. So again, this is something that, you know, will, will, would be much easier to grow up in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, you know, in sort of the southern end of its range than trying to grow it in the Piedmont or even the Triad, I dare say. And then the two other members of this complex that are more common in the Piedmont and the Triad uh, is the Viburnum prunifolium and um, Viburnum rufidulum. Uh, and I guess I'll go back a slide or two and maybe belabor this point a little more. This, uh, the shape of the leaf tip here is a pretty defining characteristic that differentiates Lentago from the other species in this complex. So this comes to a pretty uh, um, prominent tip. And if we look at the other members of this complex, prunifolium and rufidulum, they tend to have a much more rounded leaf tip, which you can sort of, which you can see here. These are again, they're much more widespread uh, in our region. Um, they have a lot of similarities. Uh, again, this is the, the rufidulum is the um, more southerly species and the prunifolium, uh, you know, is sort of the middle of Eastern North America. Uh, between these two, I'll just call out some, you know, differentiating characteristics. These, the viburnum prunifolium black haw tends to have a matte finish on the top of the leaf, whereas rufidulum tends to have a glossy finish. And if you, you know, really bear down on these uh, twigs, you'll see that the refidulum, uh, you know, has these uh, rusty colored um, uh, pubescence on the stems and on the undersides of the leaves. We'll look at that more closely in just a minute. Um, you can see the, uh, you know, the distribution of these two um, prunifolium, uh, you know, kind of widespread in our region, uh, extends west, northwest, and north of us. And rufidulum, you know, doesn't extend so far north. It, you know, extends further to the west, uh, you know, of where we are currently located. Um, so viburnum prunifolium, I'll take this one first. Uh, you know, this is often uh, seen as a, you know, small round-headed tree or a multi-stemmed shrub as shown on the picture on the left. Uh, you know, they are eight to 12 feet wide and 12 to 15 feet tall. Uh, these uh, serrate leaves uh, often have a reddish tint as they first emerge. Uh, it's kind of a medium texture, one and a half to three and a half inches long by inch to two inches wide, uh, mostly smooth, uh, and they have kind of a pale underside to the leaf. Uh, these are born on uh, narrowly or unwinged petioles. This uh, picture shown in the upper right, you know, sort of shows that stalk that's supporting the leaf. And here you can see some very tiny little ridges. Uh, these are the, you know, the, wing, the wings on the petiole. Uh, the bark is uh, grayish brown and, um, you know, can, can, be, can become a little blocky as they, as they mature. Viburnum prunifolium, uh, you know, has a uh, stiffly branched habit, uh, making it a little bit more conspicuous than some of the other species in the winter when they don't have leaves. Uh, some have likened it to uh, hawthorns uh, and sort of the stiffly branching habit that they present with. Uh, I, I've also heard it described as uh, puritanically stiff, 
Uh, the flowers, uh, again, they've sort of conformed to this pattern of these um, five petaled small flowers with yellowish stamens. Uh, they don't, you know, have a particularly strong odor. Uh, they um, are born in two to four inch cymes from April to May. And then those fruits uh, depicted on the right hand side, uh, you know, first green and then uh, ripening over the course of the season. Uh, into pinkish uh, rose and then bluish black in September and October. Um, the uh, viburnum prunifolium is, uh, you know, an important wildlife source of food for uh, a wide variety of songbirds, uh, as well as small mammals. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, something that's edible um, by, uh, to humans. Uh, we can either eat them raw right off the bush or that they have been used to make preserves. So here's just a smattering of some of the uh, native songbirds and um, that are that that rely on this as an important food stuff. Uh, and you know one of the more I think attractive attributes of viburnum prunifolium as a landscape plant is this incredible uh, fall foliage display, uh, really a a broad range from uh, bronze to, um, you know, a shiny red to a russet red. Uh, they're very adaptable plants. Um, they'll tolerate a full range of exposure from full shade to full sun uh, and a pretty wide variety of um, uh, soil conditions, including a pretty dry site. Uh, so a, a tough, adaptable plant confers a lot of wildlife benefit and, uh, you know, a lot of really showy ornamental, ornamental characteristics. Its cousin, uh, you know, the southern uh, black haw, Viburnum rufidulum, uh, this tends to uh, have more of a small tree habit um, that can, you know, run 10 to 20 feet tall. Uh, this uh, bark shown in the bottom left corner here is very reminiscent of dogwood, uh, you know, and is one of the distinguishing characteristics of Viburnum rufidulum. Uh, they tend to, as I mentioned earlier, have a glossy upper surface to the leaf, uh, you know, really shiny and almost a leathery texture. And then uh, the underside of the leaf shown here in the bottom right hand corner, you can, you know, see sort of the rust colored pubescence that I mentioned. And this is something that is um, very um, uh, distinguishing for this species. Uh, it is all, you know, those rust colored hairs are also apparent on the winter buds. And that's that small picture in the middle. Uh, and really, it's the only viburnum in our flora that has, uh, you know, this, uh, this phenomenon of, you know, rusty uh, colored hairs on the winter buds. Uh, these flowers have been described as um, slightly fragrant to non-fragrant, uh, you know, again, sort of creamy white, um, you know, those um, cymes tend to be a little larger than some of the other species excuse me, that we've talked about this evening, uh, you know, upwards of five inches in diameter. They flower uh, pretty early, late March into April. And then these um, fruits, you know, uh, again, sort of a ellipsoidal dark blue droop uh, that ripens in the fall, um, really spectacular plant. And you can see, uh, I believe on the right here, we may be looking at a cultivar called Emerald Charm. Uh, that's one that's been uh, sort of selected for particularly good fall color. Again, same cautionary notes about uh, needing to have multiple um, distinct, genetically distinct individuals. Um, if you want to have good fruit set, no matter what viburnum species we're talking about, same rules apply. Let's see. Um, we looked at sort of this, uh, you know, the veination um, on these leaves. I guess we have been in this group, uh, you know, talking about the curving and branching um, uh, veins um, as opposed to the ones that are in these neat parallel lines. So we're just completing the Lentago section and we're kind of moving on to this next group of plants sort of illustrated by this um, leaf on the, on the right. Uh, it's neatly uh, parallel, uh, lateral veins that extend from the midrib all the way out to, you know, one of the serrated teeth on the margin of the leaf. So there are a few that fit the bill here in North Carolina um, in, you know, in two different sections. I'm not going to read through this in its entirely, entirety, but um, we have viburnum lantanoides, 
uh, and that's in the section Pseudotinus. And then we have four different species in the section Odontina, o o Odontatinus, who's getting tongue tied. Again, I like to start with the ones that fall out of the dichotomous key first, uh, you know, and uh, that's going to be viburnum lantanoides. Uh, so, uh, you know, we are always trying to identify uh, plants by revisiting them multiple times, you know, over the course of the year. Sometimes the differentiating characteristic is going to be something that's more apparent in the winter, uh, you know, or you need to put together multiple lines of evidence. Um, but I think one of the um, sort of key characteristics uh, that we'd be looking for are these winter buds. Uh, you know, are they uh, covered in um, sort of tightly fitting scales as uh, viburnum, and I believe this is dentatum shown here on the right, or do these winter buds really look like, uh, you know, tight, uh, tightly folded or tightly pressed uh, immature leaves like the one on the left. And that's viburnum lantanoides. It's really the only one that has a winter bud that's shaped anything like this. Uh, so pretty um, telltale characteristic. Again, this is, uh, you know, from the Western part of the state um, and you'll find viburnum lantanoides, hobble bush and spruce fir forests. Um, <clears throat> Again, we're in kind of the southern part of its range. This, you know, can be found as far north as New Brunswick and Ontario, um, south to western North Carolina, northeast Georgia, eastern Tennessee. Um, it tends to have kind of a loose under, you know, a loose sprawling habit as sort of illustrated in some of these pictures on the right hand side. You can see some have called it rambling because these pendulous branches, as they extend further and further away from the stem, droop down, touch the soil and root in at that node. And it, you know, sort of colonizes an area. Uh, so this is, uh, these, are, these are best suited for shady, moist areas with acidic soils. Um, again, I think uh, realistically, not something that's gonna be easily grown in the Piedmont or in the triad, given the heat and the humidity that we have in the summer. Um, let's see, these have very, you know, very large leaves, uh, you know, what we describe them as broad ovate to suborbicular leaves, four to eight inches long and about as wide. They do have this uh, acuminate tip. Um, so this is a pretty different leaf shape than most of the other species that we've looked at thus far. Uh, this edge, you know, is covered in tiny sort of irregularly spaced um, teeth. The upper side of the leaf uh, is mostly smooth, and that underside is, uh, you know, pretty pu pretty densely pubescent, as you can see by this uh, this image. And again, this is a different species, um, but it conforms different species than I was using as an illustration earlier. But you can see these neat um, parallel uh, lateral veins. These do fork, uh, and some of the species in this group do, but. Uh, they'll fork pretty close to the margin of the leaf. And then if you follow that um, secondary, you know, that tertiary vein out, it does connect to a tooth out there on the very edge. So that's a pretty distinguishing pattern to sort of keep in mind. And the flowers here, this is the exception to the rule. Uh, I think all the other viburnums that we have looked at will look at. Uh, you know, are cymes that are composed um, exclusively of perfect flowers. Um, and viburnum lantanoides, you know, is the one uh, North Carolina native, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, um, that has this outer uh, sort of rim of much more showy, sterile flowers. This is akin to, you know, what you'd see in some uh, showy hydrangeas that have that same combination of perfect flowers and, and sterile uh, ray flowers. Uh, but the interior ones, uh, you know, conform to, you know, this same uh, sort of pattern that we've been describing of small white companulate um, flowers with yellow stamens. Uh, these cymes are generally three to five inches wide. Uh, they're born in uh, May, and then that fruit ripens. It sort of starts as a, a you know, in a red, uh, as shown here on the right, and then ripening to sort of a purplish black in September. 
Uh, one interesting sort of side note about viburnum lantanoides is that uh, it often starts its fall color, sort of saturation of fall color, uh, pretty early in the, uh, in the cycle. Uh, you can see this picture on the upper left. You can see the uh, mottled uh, purple coloration in those leaves. And that's something that uh, you can see in viburnum lantanoides as early as midsummer. And then it progresses, you know, as the, as the days get shorter. Uh, and that um, chlorophyll starts to break down into a really wide range of really bold colors from you know, soft uh, yellows to uh, reds and purples, really spectacular fall color on that. The larger group uh, you know, of, uh, of these um, parallel veined um, serrate leaves is this section Odontotinus. I'm going to get it the second or third time through. Uh, and uh, this is one that is more uh, widespread throughout North Carolina and really, you know, throughout the Southeast. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, Viburnum raffinesquianum. Uh, this is like a, a quintessential Piedmont species, actually endemic, uh, you know, to the Piedmont. You don't find this, uh, you know, uh, scattered to uh, other, you know, the coastal plain in North Carolina. Uh, it's really sort of a, a classic Piedmont. Um, you can see sort of a, you know, the range of this and its habit, general habit, uh, you know, is five to six feet tall, um, six to eight feet wide. Uh, during the growing season, it's got a very, you know, sort of dense cloak of uh, dark green leaves. Um, they do have this, you know, serrated edge and you can, you know, and uh, uh, neat uh, parallel venation. Uh, in the winter time, as these leaves fall off, um, you know this uh, this shrub. I guess I would describe it as highly branched, and so you end up with very fine twigs on the end of those branches, and it has a fairly soft texture in the winter landscape compared with something like Viburnum prunifolium that has kind of a stiff, you know, uh, a stiff branching uh, habit to it. Uh, so this is a this is a neat plant, a sort of a maybe a soft cautionary note about uh, for the fragrance of these flowers have been described as wet dog. So it's not everybody's cup of tea, um, but um, they are beautiful uh, and they, they are very important to, for wildlife. So again, um, these dark green coarsely toothed leaves, I might characterize this general outline as uh, uh, ov ovoid. Uh, and I would, you know, say these leaves generally run from one to two and a half inches long, a um, little narrower, you know, than they, a little narrower than they are long. And they usually have four to six uh, vein pairs, you know, running up this midrib. Uh, there, you know, it can be kind of a smooth surface on the, on the uh, upper side, but then pubescent on the underside. And then these flowers, uh, you know, which, Really, uh, well, I think one of the more outstanding aspects of this uh, Viburnum raffinesquianum is that uh, they flower abundantly in deep shade as well as in full sun. It's really well, a really well adapted understory plant that uh, thrives, um, you know, and produces a lot of flower and a lot of fruit, uh, you know, even if it's not in what we might consider classic optimal garden conditions. Um, Again, these flowers, uh, you know, the cymes run from there an inch and a half to three inches wide. Um, these usually uh, go into bloom in late April to early May. Um, and as I mentioned a moment ago, like they, they are perhaps one of the more pungent uh, of the viburn, native viburnums. Uh, and a lot of people uh, don't wanna have them too close to the house, but they are a very valuable component in the landscape. And, uh, you know, not the least of which are the fruits, these sort of like small jet black, uh, you know, or purplish to jet black um, fruits, uh, you know, are uh, very important um, food stuff for, um, for birds and small mammals. Uh, and this is a really tough landscaping plant. Uh, it, you know, it will tolerate a wide range of soil conditions, um, including really dry sites. Uh, you hardly ever see it flag in the worst droughts. Uh, even in the worst droughts. Uh, and again, it will you know, perform well in full sun to um, pretty deep shade. Um, so pretty spectacular native. They say here in Chapel Hill, 
this used to form thickets so dense that you could hardly walk through the woods. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the explosion of the deer population locally uh, has, you know, really just uh, um, come at the expense of um, Viburnum raffinesquianum. And it's not something that's so common or so thick uh, in our neck of the woods anymore. Uh, but a very classic uh, Pied Piedmont uh, plant. Let's see, they do have, like a lot of their brethren, a wide range of fall colors, you know, which, uh, you know, are uh, subtle, uh, but, you know, can be really nice additions to the landscape this time of year. And, you know, ranging from uh, sort of a purplish red to, to bronze. And these, both of these pictures were taken in our visitor parking lot here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden uh, last fall. And, you know, even within a small site, we get an incredible range of uh, variation in fall color. That was Viburnum raffinesquianum, and you know I'm going to wind up here with the Viburnum dentatum, what I'll call a complex. Um, Viburnum dentatum, var dentatum, is kind of the type here, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that particular species. Um, but it has recently been fractured in to recognize um, Viburnum carolinianum, which is, uh, you know, restricted to the western uh, part of the state. Uh, occurs, you know, mostly in the uh, southern mountains of North Carolina, north to Mitchell County and east to Polk County. Um, Viburnum dentatum, var dentatum, is kind of the opposite extreme. Uh, you know, it's uh, considered especially in most recent treatments by Alan Weekly and his colleagues, more of a coastal plain endemic. Uh, and then Viburnum recognitum, you know, is uh, the more widespread in the region. Uh, so this is some very recent uh, sort of cutting, cutting edge taxonomy and splitting these out into multiple different species. Um, let's see. So yeah, Viburnum dentatum. Um, you know, this is a multi-stemmed shrub, uh, six to 15 feet wide and about as tall, uh, arching branches that often form kind of a dome outline. Uh, one of, this has been, you know, really popular as a landscaping plant because it is tolerant of such a wide range of conditions, uh, including the entire spectrum of soil moisture. Uh, it is one of the most, most tolerant in terms of soil pH. Um, it tolerates everything from full sun to full shade. Um, and, you know, it is maybe one of the more, um, let's say adaptable or tolerant species to pruning. So um, it can be used in more formal contexts where it's, you know, treated as a hedge and not all uh, viburnums respond well to that. So sort of a close up of the leaves of viburnum dentatum. Uh, you know, again, sort of showing these um, parallel lateral veins. Uh, these are usually found in six to 10 pairs on a given leaf. Uh, dentatum often uh, has these uh, sort of bronze or reddish hues to the uh, newly emerging leaves in the spring. Uh, as they mature, uh, they have a more rounded outline than Viburnum raffinesquianum. There's a lot of overlap between the distribution of these species. So, uh, these sort of subtle distinctions in uh, the size and the shape of the leaves can be helpful in parsing these things out in the field. Uh, Viburnum dentatum and its closer relative, Recognitum and uh, Caroliniatum, tend to have uh, broader, uh, broader leaves, uh, more of a, uh, a, a rounded outline than a uh, ovoid outline. Uh, again, sort of prominent serrations along the leaf margin. And um, you know, typically um, pretty pubescent on the, particularly on the underside of the leaf, and the petioles. Like many other species of viburnums, this is an important uh, plant for pollinators. Uh, you can see butterflies and, and bees frequenting these cymes. Uh, you know, the viburnum dentatum flowers in May to June. Uh, it, um, you know, I guess it's another one of the native viburnums that has. Uh, can have an unpleasant smell. It's not obviously not deterring the bees and the butterflies here. Uh, and these flowers, uh, you know, 
born in clusters. These cymes are two to five inches wide. Again, so you can see these stamens, maybe a little, little less yellow than some of the other species that we've looked at. But again, sort of the stamen sticking out above the surface of the uh, corolla, um, giving it a very nice texture. Uh, again, this is a um, spectacular plant in fruit. Uh, this is the straight species on the left and in the middle, uh, and then a cultivar called uh, Christome or Blue Muffin is kind of a common trade name in the lower right, uh, you know, for its really showy uh, blue fruit. Um, <clears throat> again, this is uh, maybe another another opportunity to sort of reiterate that it's important that, you know, if you want heavy fruits that You've got multiple uh, genetically distinct individuals in the garden. And with den dentatum in particular, it's important that they're flowering at the same time. So I think uh, there are a lot of different cultivars of dentatum out there um, and mixing and matching them with one another and with the straight species, you know, one does run the risk of unwittingly having two just genetically distinct individuals that are blooming at different times and they've kind of missed that window for cross-pollination to occur. So blue muffin or locally known as Christome, this one on the um, on the bottom right, uh, is you know known to be compatible with another cultivar called Little Joe, uh, more very compact version of Viburnum dentatum. And again, uh, kind of like our uh, deciduous hollies, I'm thinking about Ilex verticillata in particular. Um, you know, you want to um, you want to you know do some matchmaking and make sure that you know the varieties that you're planting or mixing with the straight species overlap in their bloom time, so you have good pollination and good fruit set. Uh, I've talked about songbirds and how they rely on uh, a number of different species of viburnums as an important source of food, but I don't want to leave out our other mammalian friends. So here's just some friendly photos of some of the native mam small mammals that rely on uh, the fruit of viburnum dentatum in particular, but this is generally true of a lot of viburnum species from you know, the striped skunk to our friendly opossum and the fox squirrel. Uh, again, they, uh, viburnums confer a lot of wildlife value to the landscape, uh, whether that's mother nature's landscape out in a natural area or the landscapes that we cultivate around our homes and offices, uh, you know, can be contributing to nature's abundance. Uh, this also has really nice fall color, maybe a little more subtle than some of the other species that we've looked at, but, you know, can uh, range from soft yellows and pinks to red. Uh, and that gives it, you know, another season of, of value. And again, I've maybe, you know, sort of finishing up about where I started uh, with Michael Durr's assertion that, uh, you know, a garden without viburnum is like life without music or art. Uh, he's also, you know, uh, relayed what a lot of practitioners have, you know, uh, have decided about viburnums, that it's like a true four season uh, landscape plant. And, you know, whether it's the foliage, uh, the flowers, the fruits, the fall color, uh, you know, it confers uh, some interest in the landscape year round. And, uh, you know, they can really serve a lot of different roles from a uh, showy specimen uh, to a naturalized, you know, sort of understory um, uh, shrub layer. Uh, they can, you know, really fit in a lot of different niches within uh, Norman landscape. Uh, so I guess I'm sort of winding down here and look forward to sort of opening up the floor for questions and maybe most importantly, so I can learn from you folks. Um, some general tips about uh, bringing viburnums, you know, into cultivation. Uh, you know, many of our native species uh, have evolved in the understory of the forest or on the edge of the forest and uh, maybe counterintuitively will flower best in some shade rather than in a full sun uh, scenario. Uh, they do not respond well to high root ball temperatures. So although you know, they're, uh, they're cultivated in a nursery setting, a lot of commercial nurseries don't hold on to individuals very long. They try to turn them over quickly uh, before those uh, tender roots get out to the, you know, the, the margin of the pots. And, you know, more susceptible to, you know, dramatic swings in temperature. But don't keep them in containers too long. Buy them, bring them home, and get them in the ground. 
Uh, when you're doing that, you know, uh, think about enriching that garden soil with either composted manure or some other form of organic matter. Uh, if you want to do some supplemental fertilization, you can use something kind of all purpose, like a 10 10 10 fertilizer, uh, ideally in the late winter, uh, or, you know, something that's a slow release, like a Nutricote or an Osmocote. Uh, viburnums flower on old wood. This is an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, so they start forming uh, next year's flower buds shortly after they finish this year's flowers. Um, so if you want to prune for, you know, to constrain it to a certain size or uh, adjust its shape, you want to do that pruning shortly after it's flowered so that it has some time to re-sprout and develop new flower buds. If you wait until late in the season or definitely in the dormant season, if you wait that long, you're cutting off next year's flowers. Um, so there is this tension because if you cut off, you know, this year's, um, you know, uh, ripening, when you're doing pruning right after it's flowering, you're cutting off some of the fruit that you might enjoy at the end of the season. Um, so it's kind of pitting next year's flowers versus this year's fruit, but uh, food for thought. Uh, and then viburnums, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, pretty tasty to the white-tailed deer. Uh, and so you will, you know, want to be uh, thinking, you know, if these are important, you know, specimens, they might benefit from some protection from deer browse. Uh, I think the other note that I'd make is that we unfortunately have this uh, nefarious uh, pest on our borders. This is the viburnum leaf beetle. Uh, and it's, um, you know, been in the uh, North, it's been in North America since 1947. It was first detected in Canada. Um, let's see, and then, you know, first reported up in New York State in 1996. So there's some lag time there, but oftentimes uh, that lag time is just because people aren't looking closely. Um, but since we have been paying closer attention to this in the last, you know, 15 years, uh, we have seen um, viburnum leaf beetle, you know, progressively, uh, you know, move uh, further south. Uh, you know, as you can see in the picture on the left, it's a skeletonizer and uh, feeds on these leaves. So it's not going to kill an, an individual plant, uh, you know, in a single season, but it does, um, it does put it, it does tax it. You know, and as those populations become more and more dense, it becomes a more and more serious threat. So um, there's a range of susceptibility to viburnum leaf beetle. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the native species that we've covered here tend to be kind of a preferred food stuff. So we're just kind of uh, waiting with bated breath, uh, you know, trying to brace ourselves um, to see if it can survive in North Carolina and what sort of an impact it will have. I think there's some uh, sort of intrinsic um, reproductive um, realities for the viburnum leaf beetle in terms of how much of a cold season it needs for the eggs to uh, be viable. And there have been some question marks about how far south it can encroach. Um, but we're, you know, I guess we're, we're all hoping that um, most of our viburnums, you know, can be um, uh, spared you know, uh, big impact from this viburnum leaf beetle. And I think that's what I've got. Hey, Daniel, nice presentation. Um, oh, thanks, Ken. Can these be propagated? Like if I, I have a, a Acer folium in my yard, is it softwood or hardwood cuttings or how can I best propagate? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think that um, most of our, uh, I think that most of them, it's a softwood cutting. Okay. I'll double check that with our, you know, our, our uh, plant propagation wizard, Matt Goki, who runs the nursery here. Um, but I, I, you know, that, that's my recollection of that most of them we're propagating from uh, softwood cuttings. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll take that as an opportunity to say if you can grow it from seed. Right. You know, you're contributing to the great experiment of outcrossing. And you know, ensuring that you're going to have a greater fruit set. I know it's a longer it's a longer game. Well, I think like like uh, Linda Waltrip said, you probably have to put Delnet bags around them because all all of our seeds disappear yeah. pretty quickly. Oh. So 
<laughs> when I was a plant breeder, I used to put Del net bags around things to keep right. critters from eating them. So yeah, that's a big challenge. We've been be building these seed frames here, you know, with uh, you know, sort of a, a wood lid that's got you know hardware cloth or metal screening on top of it to try to keep the critters out. But it's like every every day we walk into the nursery and we find some new travesty where some critter has outsmarted us. Right, right. It's like an arms race. But if you do get some seeds. They do germinate, but oh, they are so little when they come <laughs> up there. It's, you know, even in one summer, it, they didn't get much growth on them. So are they in general slow growing, would you say, just in general? Or can you make any statement about that? Um, I don't know that I would, you know, necessarily characteristic characterize them as slow growing. I mean, for a woody, uh, you know, you're, it's going to take a couple of years to get, you know, any reasonable size. And you might be looking at, you know, upwards of five years before it's big enough to flower. But that's not, you know, I would I'd say that's sort of within normal expectations for, you know, most woody native woody plants. Again, I'll, you know, shameless self promote the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And we've got a, you know, a, a daily plant sale that we operate here. Uh, we're gonna open it up on the Ides of March and it will run through November. It's a rotating inventory, but uh, Matt is uh, really a wizard about propagating woody plant material. And I know that we'll have viburnums on that sale throughout the season. Okay, hey, buy a few, cutting a few and seed, sow a few seeds for later. Bingo, you got it. Because <laughs> you'll be definitely ticking the boxes of having lots of different genetic. There we go. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Do you know if anybody is researching cultivars and the pollen and nectar compared to the just the wild species? Like they're doing in a lot of different plants, but is anybody researching viburnums? Do you know? I'm sure that there are. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know of any individuals, you know, by name, but it seems like this is such a um, popular plant group, you know, that nurserymen and women are, you know, uh, really keen on, you know, putting more varieties out there that are, you know, better performing, uh, you know, and more marketable. Daniel? Yeah. I noticed that you didn't wade into the murky waters of viburnum carolinianum and viburnum recognitum. Um, I'm old enough to remember when recognitum and dentatum were split out and now then they were lumped back together. And now you're telling me there's a third one and they're splitting them again. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, you know, I'm just looking at my cheat sheet here, which is, you know, essentially the printout of the slides, you know, which will be in the PDF. But, uh, you know, I think what Alan has done is say that, um, you know, recognizing some, uh, you know, some consistent um, differences in those um, species in terms of petioles uh, and, uh, and the symes, uh, you know, and particularly about their uh, pubescence or lack thereof. In the horticultural trade, are most of the viburnums or a lot of the viburnums Asian? Where do yes. the where do the rest of the world's viburnums come from? Yeah, so you know the, that's a great question, Ken, uh, and I probably uh, skip that out of nervousness at the front end of the talk. But you know the genus Viburnum uh, is estimated to have somewhere between 160 and 200 species, uh -huh. and the distribution of them, it you know, sort of spans North America and mostly in North America and Asia. So most of most of the species are uh, East Asian species. Uh, and that's where most of our horticultural introductions, you know, have come from. I was wondering if there was any like invasive exotic viburnums from Asia. I mean, we, we see a lot of these like uh, Amur honeysuckles and things that are opposite leave things that we see in the woods and Nandinas yeah. and things. So I can't right. think of offhand a viburnum that's invasive. Viburnum dilatatum is spreading here. Oh, okay. And there are others. I'm keeping my eyes out on them. Yep. Yeah, Alan has covered about ha covered six different uh, non-native um, species in the flora, which means those are six species that 
um, have ex exist outside of cultivation. There are many more non-natives that, you know, are sort of restricted to a cultivated setting, but um, six different species, uh, you know, that have persisted cultivation beyond cultivation, I should say, and some that have even naturalized. So um, dilatatum, ceturgium, ratitophyllum, um, let's see, I've actually got the, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll send you, I'll send you a slide that's got it. There's a weird one with red fruits that grows all over in quick big thickets at Renolda Gardens in Winston-Salem. And I've never been quite sure what that one is. Huh. Anybody? Anybody? Dilatatum is there. Yes. Tigrum is there. Um, seems like there was another one too. Yeah. Well, the, the Reynolds family had been bringing in stuff for a hundred years from Asia. Right. So it's, I think Renolda Gardens has some of the most dense invasive exotic right. shrubs of any place I've ever seen. It's the poster child for invasive species in our area. <laughs> we have that same viburnum at the Bob Garden. We've dug hundreds. Okay. Which garden is that at? Uh, that's at the, it's called the Bob Garden. It's a public garden in Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay. So. It's also a problem at the Arboretum at Tanglewood. Uh -huh. Opulus is another, uh, I believe that's a European species that, you know, is more common. It's a non-native, but one that has, uh, you know, persisted cultivation, I believe, in the western part of the state. And that's another, that one kind of matches up with our viburnum acerifolium and that it's one of those palmately lobed and palmately veined. Right. Does lantanoides look anything like some of these invasive ones? Yes, yeah, so lantanoid, I guess, you know, a lot of the non-natives um, have that sort of sterile ray flower on the outer edge like lantanoides does. Not all of them, but I'd say it's probably a more common, seems like it's a more common phenomenon with the Asian species. So you need to really see if it's got red fruit. I mean, wait and see if it's going to change color, right? Because it could be lantanoides instead of one of those invasive. Right. right. Yeah. And again, remember that lantanoides is, you know, restricted to the very, you know, southern part of the mountains of North Carolina. So it's very limited in, it, in its range. If you're As a plant physiologist, I've always been interested in that interesting kind of pinkish, purplish autumn color. Um, that I don't see in many other plant groups that, and I'm wondering if there's some interesting plant pigment that's in those that aren't well represented everywhere else, but it always is very striking to me that kind of pinkish purple color in the fall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is very unique. Uh, you know, imagine, uh, I mean, that's not my, certainly not my field of expertise, but um, I'm sure there's a very interesting story there. There's a weird anthocyanin in there somewhere. Yeah. Right, right. I have a uh, wild, I, I think it's a viburnum in my wood margins. Uh, it's very small. The deer have browsed it pretty heavily. Um, it, but it, it has very distinguished light colored creamish gray bark on the young branches and, and up to three year old branches. Um, it's not, it doesn't have. Um, the din dentatum type, it doesn't have the serrated leaves or they're very fine serrations and it's a kind of a small leaf, but I know you probably can't identify just on those, but I think it might be uh, invasive or hard to tell. Oh, well, hard to tell. I mean, it sounds like I mean, prunifolium is a possibility, you know, as a native that would might exhibit that kind of bark characteristic and that kind of leaf you know, shape or that leaf margin. And if you're in an urban county, that's probably a invasive locality likelihood. Yeah, I'm in Southeast Guilford County, so I'm pretty far from oh, okay. a lot of landscaping, but uh, I am in a urban county, but a little ways out. No, you could send pictures like of that to our informal groups IO and um, Probably a lot of people would 
help identify it. Oh, oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. I'm putting my email address there in the chat box. Uh, you know, if you, any of you want to follow up with me about, uh, you know, either identification stuff or the availability of different viburnums through, you know, our nursery and our plant cell area, please feel free to follow up. I like uh, I like I like losing at stump the chump in terms of plant ID, and uh, I really like engaging the rest of my team. That's one of my greatest joys about sitting in this chair at the botanical garden. Is I've got a team of ten folks, you know, that uh, all have very complementary expertise, and we love you know digging into these mysteries. So send me some pictures of that mystery plant. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. I have, well, I have another that. question. Uh, if if you never see it bloom, or you don't, you know, but then all of a sudden there's a, it has fruit. My next door neighbor has a what is kind of like a tree. It's not a multi uh, stem thing. It's it's more of a tree, but the fruit was definitely a viburnum uh, fruit. But he he called me over to look at it because he said I've never seen this bloom. But look at all this fruit. And I uh, sent a picture to Stephanie Jeffers, you know, anyway, and she agreed that it was probably a viburnum, but I don't have any idea what kind, but, but why would it, would it, why would it have met, he, it's right off his driveway. So he said, I can't believe I missed seeing it flower, but it had to have flowered. <laughs> right. Must, must, ha must have. <laughs> it must have. Either that or he, you know, either that or that's a plant patent, you know, begging for, <laughs> begging for minting. <laughs> No, no, you'd want the flower and no fruit if you wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over there and visit and, and more and see if I can see it flower. Let's see. My possum haw, is that the one? Has never bloomed besides getting another possum haw. What other viburnum would be a bloom time match? So it's got to be the same species. I don't know whether it's Gale still on the line. Um, it's got to be the same species. Uh, you know, again, prunifolium is closely related to uh, Viburnum lentago and Viburnum rufidulum. Um, but I would hazard a guess that there's enough sort of, you know, distance between them since they've been treated as different species where they wouldn't cross pollinate one another on their own. So. You do, uh, uh, you, uh, you do need to get a, a di another sort of uh, genetically distinct possum haw. I guess that's not. That's, that, in, that's, in the that's, that's for the question of setting fruit, not in terms of whether it blooms, right? Um, Gail, are you able to unmute? Because I'm, I'm not sure right. that your question. Yeah, that's a good, uh, you, you may have hit it, uh, clarified that. Gail, are you still here? I am still here. I am still here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. So was your question, uh, your question was about blooming? It, not, it doesn't bloom, therefore there is no fruit. Hmm. So it's getting gigantic and it has beautiful glossy leaves, um, but it never has gotten any flowers. Are you pruning? I've never pruned it. Hmm. Is it in what kind of sun exposure is it in? It is against a fence and it is about 20 feet from a oak tree, but the oak tree is self uh, pruning. So the branches are pretty high up. It does not get any Western sun. Mm -hmm. Only Eastern sun south side of the house yeah i mean I, I would suspect that you've got enough light in that situation that that's not what's going on right very wet my yard is very wet i thought it was a good match but um have you done any supplemental fertilizing i have not um you maybe i'll try that okay I've, I've, I've come across that in the literature that you know if you want to give them an extra boost uh kind of like a uh, winter time, late winter, uh, you know, fertilization, uh, you know, can, if it's, I guess the reference that I saw said, if it's something that, you, you know, has bloomed heavily and you want to sort of like keep sustaining, you know, that 
density of blossom. So I, I think it's probably worth a shot for you. Okay, Go that's ahead. that's a great idea. I will do that. Thank you. I was going to say somebody gave me what was supposed to be a viburnum nudum, and I've had it probably 15 years. And two years ago, for the first time, it bloomed. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know whether we, got, I know where I live, we haven't had a lot of rain until the last three seasons. So I don't know if that had a, had something to do with it or whether somebody planted something nearby and, you know, all of a sudden it, it got uh, pollinated. I don't right. know. I, I like that story. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that may, because it means that another, you know, that one of your neighbors is also gardening with native plants, which I like that story. <laughs> Yeah, my my viburnum. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I just feel like deer browsing is in the winter. Heavy deer browsing. If it's not too, if it's tall, it'll be beyond the deer. But if it's short, like mine are, it's. To, I feel like it's the deer browsing that keep them from blooming. Mm. That's an excellent point. Right? Yeah. I was going to say my. Um, Viburnum nudum blooms great, but I don't get fruit. But now why? <laughs> because I didn't. I didn't realize you, you, they they weren't self compatible. So, but yes. but I have mine growing. I have it planted in the shade right by my downspout from the house, so it does get a lot of water. So, and it's doing great. It's not that old, but it's very tall already, and it's it's very nice. It just doesn't give me the fruit. <laughs> So I need to get another one. Yeah, well, the, you know, preparing for this talk really kind of opened my eyes to sort of re-examine our landscapes around here. And, you know, we have recently planted uh, viburnums in some recent renovations and, you know, want to make sure that we're setting them up for, you know, fruiting success and as well as taking stock of, you know, what has been out there in the landscape for a while that may not be performing, you know, to its potential. Mm -hmm. When the leaves start coming out, we'll all go out and see if we can ID our viburnums. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So I know it's a viburnum, but which one? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I'll be going out and saying, well, I've been, you know, sort of by rote recognition, thinking that that's a raffinesquianum. But let me go and look at the real evidence and see if it lines up. Yes, I was wondering if you could repeat um, or at least send our host when you will be having your plant sales. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, we're, I'll repeat our um, our daily plant sale, uh, which is open at any time we're open. Uh, that's going to uh, we're going to resume that on March 15th, Tuesday, March 15th. And then we've got a big plant sale event coming up on Saturday, May 7th. And in addition to plants from our own nursery, uh, we like to use that spring event to sort of celebrate other local growers that specialize in native plants. So we will have four other nurseries joining us for that event, uh, Growing Wild, Cure, Mellow Marsh, and Field to Cottage, uh, you know, all sort of here in the Piedmont, uh, you know, bringing their own, their own goods to the event. So that's from 1030 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday. May 7th. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's Thank really been a, a pleasure visiting with you.